we're going to kind of get into partials and the digital side. It, it, it seems like, of course, for the last 10 or 15 years, we've had a ton of digital as it relates to the fixed side. And then here in the last four or five years, we've had a lot of push doing digital with dentures. But there's been a little bit of a lack of information on at flexible partials or even partials in general. So we're going to talk about partial dentures. The part one is going to be, you know, creating your partial denture, digitally designing your partial denture. And then it'll, we'll go into um, kind of end with uh, milling, creating the base of your partial, flexible partial, and creating the teeth, whether it be milling or printing. And, and that's where it'll end. And then the part two that we'll do next month will be uh, taking the parts that you've created and uh, doing, you know, attaching them together, finishing everything, polishing, and having something to deliver at the end. So first, uh, you know, the materials we'll talk about are Meyerson's. Um, you can kind of apply this to, you know, other materials. So um, take this information, you know, no matter who you use, but I do believe Meyerson is the best. And, you know, I'm a dental lab in Virginia. Uh, you know, I'm not going to use a material that's going to be a detriment to the, the, the my lab. You know, kind of talk a little bit about why I think those materials are the best. But Meyerson's been in business for over 100 years. And most specifically on the removable side, and there's very few companies that kind of specialize in removable, and I think Meyerson, you know, is that that company. And uh, the material that we'll talk about as far as fabricating the teeth on our flexible partial are gonna, is going to be Trusana, and that's a printed material that Meyerson has released um, here in the last year. And uh, um, you know, they're a tooth company. That's how they started 100 years ago is carded teeth. And that's still what they, one of the things they provide today. And so, you know, they've seen an industry drifting to where, you know, labs are going to be their own tooth manufacturers. And instead of fighting against that growth, that movement, Meyerson is, is you know, developed a material to allow labs to fabricate their own teeth. So we'll kind of talk about that towards the end. But I think, you know, all in all, Meyerson is a company that's going to be on your side, that's going to be um, right there with you as you move forward with any of their materials that you'll see here today. The base materials, Duraflex, that we're going to talk about. This is a flexible partial material, um, you know, uh, a competitor to any nylons that are out there, but it is not nylon, it is polypropylene. There's some advantages to a polypropylene uh, material comes in pink, a couple different pink shades, as well as a clear version, which is called VisiClear. So they're the same plastic, the same material, just one has pigmentation to it and one does not. VisiClear, everything that you see today, you could follow the same fabricating process and create a clear version or mostly clear. It's kind of a hazy clear, um, as you can kind of see in the picture. Um, version. So everything that you see today can be applied to both of these materials. Um, and as you can see here, again, a little bit of the hazy clear it actually works much better as far as aesthetics are concerned than optically crystal clear. You'd kind of think that, a, you know, a crystal clear clasp or partial would be the most aesthetic, but crystal clear tends to show shadows and uh, kind of look black in certain areas. So in other words, where this clasp rolls into this more pink base, it, a lot of other clear plot, you'd kind of be able to see all the way down that tunnel, which would show as a dark tunnel. And patient says, oh, this is dirty here. I take it out. It looks fine. I put it back in. I see that it's dark. And so the VisiClear doesn't have that issue or as much of that issue, um, uh, you know, because of that haziness kind of shuts down that transitional light, kind of absorbs the light that it's sitting on which is great if it's sitting on a tooth or on pink. So the process today is gonna to be to show you, you know, what the material is, right? So the baseline of why you would use the material. Next, uh, we'll talk about, you know, designing and milling, and kind of what are those advantages that are associated with that. We'll go over designing with ExoCAD. Um, I'll kind of do a live demonstration of ExoCAD. Um, I, I feel like there's a 
lot of information as it relates to, to 3Shape. Um, 3Shape and ExoCAD are somewhat similar in their workflow through this. So um, I'll show you some examples of 3Shape, but I'll actually physically live design with ExoCAD. And then uh, talk about nesting and milling the case, as well as I'll talk, kind of touch on the teeth as far as actual 3D printing the teeth. So some of the advantages of Duraflex. One, it is a 100% or almost 100% dense material. Nylons, uh, like some of other materials, the most popular, you know, some of the most popular other thermoplastics uh, or these types of partials that are out there um, are nylons. And the way that kind of a very generic or, or, or very basic concept of why they can be flexible with their, their chemistry is the kind of gaps and spaces between the molecules, the bubbles, if you will. And as you flex a partial, those bubbles swoosh and then retract. And that's why those materials can be flexible. Problem is that allows stains, bacteria, and smells, uh, along with the moisture that comes into those bubbles or porosity. Duraflex is a crystalline plastic. Crystalline plastics does not allow for the absorption of moisture, which means also stains, bacteria, and smells can't absorb. So it's a much healthier, longer lasting um, option that way. Um, as you can see, here's a magnification of, of the plastic. Um, the crystalline structure is what allows it to be 100% dense and flexible um, compared to like a nylon or something more amorphous type of a plastic. Um, so, you know, if you do a lot of research on crystalline plastics, which is what Duraflex and VisiClear are, you'll find that they're used in other industries in the harshest environments because of their toughness, um, their ability to, to not absorb moistures and, and, and get affected by those. And so it's, you know, in our industry, you can't get much more high moisture than in a mouth. So it's a really good option, really good choice to use crystalline plastics. I mean, you know, valve plastic, our most popular, uh, one of the most popular resins that are used, you know, it's been around since 1947. And, and so, you know, technologies and materials have changed a lot over, you know, 70, plus, almost 70 years. So, so to kind of explain crystallinity and, 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 and amorphous, you know, it's kind of like what you see here, you know, molecules are densely packed together with basically no gaps or spaces between them. And so that's kind of like table salt, a pile of table salt compared to cotton candy, um, you know, where there is a lot of gaps in space between those. So that maybe to, to try to describe it better what I'm, I'm getting across with the way that these plastics are very different. Uh, that also allows for crystalline plastics to have a melting point. Whereas materials like um, Bauplast or some, some of the TCS materials, they're nylons, they actually just get softer as they get hotter. So if you were to inject the material, you would get it hotter and hotter and hotter until it gets softer and softer and softer until it's soft enough that the machine could inject it into the mold. Whereas Duraflex actually has a melting point. You get up until it gets past its melting point, point it liquefies, um, and then you inject it. The advantage that that gives when it comes to milling is that tool is going to be going at a high rate of speed and will create a lot of friction and therefore heat. So rather than to melt and wind up on the tool, and break your tool or cause some problems or require you to have to mill it using water, um, can mill these materials dry and they mill very nice because you the tool's not getting hot or hot enough to cause it to melt and cause an issue. So it's a very nice tooling uh, material or milled material to be milled. Um, uh, you can see here some independent testing done on absorption of liquids. Um, Duraflex basically is as close to nothing as you can get. These are some of the materials that are out there. This is only over a 24 hour period. So it was still going for a while. So a lot of absorption of moistures. All right, so um, that gives you, you know, I just wanted to make sure I created a baseline 
for what these materials are. Now, if you're gonna use any other millable materials, that's fine. Um, you know, we're gonna get into design. And I think a lot of the design that I'm gonna show is gonna apply no matter what material you're using. So, uh, um, you know, I just wanna let you know that's what I use. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over now to my design software. And, uh, Great, Chris. While you're doing that, I'm going to launch our first polling question. And it is, do you currently use Meyerson's Duraflex material when milling partial appliances? If you could please choose, that would be great. Thank you. Great, so I'm just gonna get things loaded up. So I have a quick second. All right, so, so um, here's my case. Uh, this is again gonna be through Exacad. So you'll see here, these individual teeth are marked for the missing teeth and you can choose partial frame will be the option to choose to continue for it. I chose acrylic PMMA. There is no choice for Duraflex or VisiClear. But the general, these are the general settings that are involved with it, and that works you know, perfectly fine. So I've marked each individual, individual tooth. I choose to splint these together. Um, that I found is nice when it comes to flexibles. We're still going to be looting the teeth into the sockets mechanically kind of a reverse engineering. And we'll talk about that in the next uh, episode or next part of this next month. But I do like to splint them. You don't have to, but I feel like all these teeth work together to stay in, the, in place. And it just amplifies that mechanical retention. So that's what I choose. And then you're gonna choose here, your adjacents, all right? So that's just so that the software will, um, adapt those teeth as you go through. I'm not marking and opposing just because this is a uh, uh, demonstration and then you'll hit design. So that's simply how you'll set up your work order. And you'll notice I hit design and not my partial frame. So I'm going into my regular design software. So with Exacad, you can choose to go to design or you can choose to go into framework. This would be more if you are truly just creating a framework, um, you know, with mesh work, finish lines, all that. In this case, we're doing our flexible partial and so, um, you know, that allows for that avenue. And so we load our model in, you can see here, here's our model. We're missing two premolars here, two premolars and a molar here, and that's what I had marked. So the first thing the software is going to ask you to do is kind of line up your path of insertion. Now, this is specific to the teeth you're going to create. We're actually going to create the teeth first. But I still recommend you line things up looking at the undercuts of the specific teeth, anticipating that later you're going to have to line this up again or survey this to have the best um, uh, path of insertion and individual undercut on the tooth as it relates to the clasp. So at this point, kind of line things up, thinking about where you're going to place the teeth and also how the clasps are going to be and how everything is going to go as far as that's concerned. Once we do that, we once we hit next, it locks that position into place. Now, if you were doing like a central or something like that, you could copy or mirror so you get an exact duplicate. I will say that the software gets a teeny bit more glitchy when you do that. Um, definitely smooth the bottom once the tooth is created because it's going to be like a pontic. Definitely smooth the bottom. That seems, once you interface with the bottom, that seems to kind of move that glitchiness away a little bit. Um, but generally, I don't cho choose to mirror anything unless, again, it's an anterior tooth, something like that. So first thing it's going to do is it's going to pick a section in case, in this case, it's saying 
contact from the mesial contact of number five, which will be from five to six, click there and just drag it across. And you don't have to spend a lot of time just generally click and click. You'll be able to move these teeth after the fact. At this point, you have to go down and choose a different mold. Um, this mold should be fine, but you know you have all different shapes and molds to, to choose from. Um, so you can kind of decide which one you, you want at that point. You can even choose a one mold for one side and then go next, choose your teeth and choose a mold, different mold for the other side. All right, and even once you choose, you can kind of move them around and, and stuff. But once you go to next, it will then allow you to kind of manipulate the teeth a little bit more. There's a chain mode and a simple mode. It'll start you out in the chain mode and you can kind of click these end discs and kind of make the teeth smaller and bigger and kind of get them into a, a position that you feel like is at least close to the position you feel like they should be in. It's weird whenever you uh, start designing on a computer, it's just like instruments or a handpiece and you go to a strange workbench or something, it feels different. This is on my laptop, so I can kind of be in a quiet room, but you know how everything feels different is kind of inter interesting, whether it be the analog or the, the digital version. All right, so once you get that, you can go to simple. And now you can kind of go in here and you can kind of individually move the teeth. You can make one bigger, smaller. So right there, I'm hitting shift and I'm dragging and moving back to make it bigger and smaller. Um, if I hit control and then click on my mouse, I can kind of make it twisty and turning. I can hit shift and control and kind of make it oblong as I what the, the direction I drag it in. There's a lot that can be done there, but this is generally getting the teeth in the position that you want, but not the final, because then I'll go to next. Once you go to next, that locks that in and gives you specific, um, more aesthetic options. Like we can go to tooth and we can kind of drag this over and kind of fill that area. If you don't like the cusps, you can click on the cusp and you can kind of flatten just the cusp down. Um, if you ever you make a move you don't like, you can go over here and hit the undo and it just takes away that last step. If I kept clicking undo, it would go back every step uh, in this section. So you have that ability. If you go under here, click tooth parts, you can click the bottom, kind of line it up to be over the edge if you want. There's a lot that can be done there. Now, some softwares, you know, we're gonna have to be off the ridge eventually. A lot of softwares you can kind of lift it, but then the tooth gets goofy. I'll show you here in a second how I kind of deal with adapting to the ridge. But so uh, you can really get into things, kind of fill these in and come back with your smooth, and you can kind of smooth over. So the add remove, if you hit shift, it will remove. And I hit undo. If I don't hit shift, that's right. So shift is remove, no shift is is add on the smoothing side if you hit this don't hit anything on your keyboard it just kind of does a gentle smooth if you hold shift be careful because it'll take a lot away and kind of smooth that down so that's with the pushing the shift clicking the shift or not and that's it you can go here and get real fine like if you wanted to kind of re uh, really define anatomy um, you know, there's a lot that you could kind of do to highlight. You can come up here and if you wanted some striations going across the teeth and add texture. There's just a lot that you can do with the, the software. This one's a very specific kind of circular addition or subtraction. I don't use that one too often, but it's nice for like a rest prep uh, on a crown because it makes more of a, a uniform kind of chunk uh, out of the material. Um, and so you have free, which is add, remove, smooth, flatten. You have anatomic, which are cusps and different sections. You can lock things that don't move as you move other things. And then adapt. So with adapt, you have your pontic and your proximal. You'd also have your occlusion if I had imported it and opposing. But the first thing I'll do is go to pontic. And I'm going to take this to uh, about 60 to 70 
tenths uh, of a millimeter or six to seven tenths of a millimeter. And then I'm going to uh, hit adapt to gingiva. And what it's going to do is you'll see it'll take a second. It'll just adapt this up off the gingiva. And that'll kind of give me that gap that I'll, I'll be looking for when it comes to the space we're creating for the uh, partial that we're gonna create. All right, and you can see we're post through. Now we've adapted up off of there. All right, um, then what I'll do is I'll take away, so these little eyeballs, so that's actually what these are, you can take away what's there, right? So I just took away the, the model and here's our underside. And what I'll do is I'll go back here to the fray, I'll go to the smooth and I will hit that shift button. Now, also if you hit shift and roll your mouse, you can make the, spit, the size of what you're affecting bigger and smaller. So I'm gonna make that bigger, I'm gonna hit the shift and I'm just gonna make circles with the shift and the smoothing hit, which is gonna remove a good bit of material. I'm gonna make the bottom of that tooth softer. Um, Maybe hopefully at some point Exocad will kind of have that automatically happen, but I found that I just get less glitches if I smooth out the bottom of the tooth before I move on. And it only takes, I don't know, you know, I'm talking a lot and kind of explaining things, but it only takes 30 seconds to a minute to kind of go over these teeth and smooth them out and get them prepared for that. You can bring back your model. You can kind of look at the necks of the teeth with Duraflex, it's nice and translucent. So you're gonna see the next of the teeth through the base material a lot of the time. And so kind of preparing, making sure that we're kind of showing around the same, like if you had a lot of gingiva that was resorbed, you could have a, a lot of neck showing and then that would look weird, right? And you'd have necks in this area and then you might have a neck that drops way down and you'd see that through the base material. Um, and so you can kind of manipulate that at that point. Um, one thing I'll do here is I'll kind of fill in this bottom area. So when I do my connectors, being that I splinted these together, um, I'll kind of show you the advantage that this will give me, but I'll just add a little bit there to make a larger contact area. All right. So next, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my model away. I'm gonna look down on the teeth fairly parallel, right? So I'm trying to look evenly down um, on those teeth and I'm gonna add a custom view. You see this over here to the right where my mouse is. When I click that, I've now added a custom view. So I can move this anywhere. And once I click back on custom view one, it's gonna bring me right to that spot, which is handy for what we'll do next. So I'm gonna to go to my attachment option, right? So this is where you could add like a keyway attachment or uh, something like that. You have the ability to add an attachment. So let's say you were gonna do a crown and you wanted like a delbo attachment off of the distal of the crown. This is where you would add that attachment. Um, if you were wanting to do a keyway and you've already created the keyway, but you wanted to create the um, subtraction of the keyway. So you wanted to create the, the takeaway of the keyway on one side. That's where you would click on subtraction. So that's what we want, because I'll show you here in a second, we're gonna be taking away material. I'm then gonna click down on my library and I'm gonna choose generic. And then I'm gonna click here on this and I want cut out. All right, so to re-go over that generic, the generic that's shown isn't the same generic. So you'll click on your generic, you'll click on the down area and you wanna choose cut out. What it creates is this little circle, if you can, a uh, little uh, tube, if you can see that. Now, what I'm gonna do is go to the bottom of the tooth. Let me go ahead in my custom view, make sure I got it just right. And I'm gonna click. Once I click there, I can take this and I can rotate it, I can move it, I can scale it. First thing I'm gonna do Scale, I'm hitting my shift key and I'm gonna drag over towards that arrow to make it bigger. The tooth is solid. I'm gonna go ahead and dim it down, right? So this eye, if we take this bar, you can dim it down or make it, but I wanna see through. And I wanna see this sitting inside. So I'm gonna move, you wanna be deep into the tooth. This is gonna be our mechanical retention, but you don't want it to be because sometimes 
when you go to do your base and adapt, it'll it'll give you errors and fuss with you on that a little bit. So I want that to be dead center. It's a good size. You don't want to make it too big um, and let it sit down in just a few. I mean, we're probably looking at, you know, we're looking at about four to five millimeters deep in there. And I just clicked on my tools and, and did that. All right. Once you get it in the position you like, I'm going to hit apply. All right, and then I'm going to go to the next tooth. All right, and you can see it's now taken away where that tube is. And I'll show that a little bit better later, but I'm going to go to my custom view. All right, I'm going to go to my scale button. I'm going to click on that hit shift. I'm going to make it a little smaller because we're now a premolar. I'm going to hit my move button. And I'm going to bring it up a little bit so we're not too deep. Go to my custom view. That looks pretty good. I'm going to rotate it because you can see that not quite lined up perfectly. That looks good. And then I'm going to hit apply. And then we'll, and then we'll go to our, oops, she didn't like that. All right, so she's fussing with me. Let me, I'm gonna go back. So let me go back, because it's taking me all the way back. All right. So it fussed with me a little bit on there. Again, uh, this is the trials and tribulations of doing live demos. Um, it's funny, I recorded this process in a video form for whenever you can uh, have issues with doing live demonstrations. So. Second, I'll get us back to where we were. So, here and smooth. So, again, we're smoothing the bottom just so the software has a little bit of an easier time with adapting later on. All right, so I still got my custom view. So now let's go back to attachment. We're going to go to extract, uh, subtract. We're going to go to our generic here. We're going to go to our cut out here. We will scale. We will dim this down. At least you guys are getting to see it again in case you miss something. And then we hit apply. It's going to take it. Next, we'll place them there. We'll hit our scale. We'll scale it down to move. Scale that down. Again, these a little deep. And you could put multiple holes per case. Just found there's no reason for that. We'll hit apply. And go to the next one. Let's hit our custom view. The reason I keep hitting the custom view is you just want to make sure that your um, the retentive sockets that you're creating or the retentive holes you're creating with this adaption aren't too unparalleled from each other. What I have found is we will have, um, we'll create issues for the mill, right? So the milling machine only has certain degrees of undercut and these are pretty dang parallel. The walls on the inside are very parallel. So it makes that extra sensitive. So not going too deep and keeping things fairly parallel, like you can see that one's off a little bit. So we'll go ahead and rotate. We'll hit our control and just move that so that it's more in line with the rest. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you want that to be close so that the software has an easier time with that. Yeah. 
retiring. So once you hit apply on the last one, make sure everything looks good to you, and then you just hit next. Now, um, all right, so this is good. Kind of got involved in this, but um, it's letting me know, oh, you never did adapt the interproximals, right? And so if I bring back my model, you know, I'm hitting on these interproximals in a couple areas. And so the same thing as we adapted the Pontic, we can leave that at zero and adapt. Now, one thing I've noticed is if you see any little bit showing through, it can cause there to be a possible, so once we get the base designed, we can run into uh, errors when we adapt the teeth to the base. That's the only time I've really ran into some things. And I'll kind of show you how we can head those off at the pass a little bit. And this is one of the ways is making sure that you're just shy of the contacts. All right, everything's good. I go to next. Now it's going to kind of shift over to what do you want to do next? Well, do you want to design a cast partial frame? So you could actually design teeth and then so you can make a frame to them, but that's not what we're doing. The next choice is a little confusing. It's design over denture, gingiva. Um, we're not, I mean, we're doing a denture, it's partial denture, right? So don't let that fool you. So we're going to click that, right? And then we're going to go to next. When we go to next, it's going to take us to a separate design. It's kind of saved our teeth, and now we're going to create our base. So First thing we're gonna do is create a virtual bottom, which means we're gonna create the, 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 the surface that we're gonna make our partial to. So now, because we kind of align things, you can see the undercut, it's showing with this kind of shaded area. These are the undercuts that are presenting themselves. And that actually looks really good. If I was to kick this over and then hit set insertion, direction is gonna change that look. And you see how everything's crazy. So at this point, you wanna kind of look down. It's almost like surveying, line everything up, hit, to the direction and that'll give you everything you need as far as where your undercuts are going to present themselves. Bottom properties, um, this is like your smoothing. I will set my smoothing at about 10. What this is going to do is take any sharp areas off and make everything soft as far as the model is concerned, which is good for a, a comfortable partial. Um, no sharp areas. Uh, milling diameter, 1.2 is good. Uh, even if you're going to be milling down as small as a, a, a six tenths of a millimeter burr, um, this just allows for leeway. We aren't doing a precise margin uh, like on a crown, all right? Everything is, needs to be softer and easier to deal with. So 1.2 is good. Uh, the offset here, um, you know, if you find your partials are fitting too tight, maybe even having a bit of a bounce in the palette, that's where you want to have some consideration of, of making your offset, that's just making everything a bit thicker. Next, we go to our block out undercuts. Um, I'll put this at zero. I like to do my undercut myself and I'll show you here in a second. So zero, no real angle, hit apply. Once I hit apply, it's now gonna create our virtual bottom or our new model over top of this model for lack of a better term. So, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why I like to do videos sometimes is because of the waiting for things to load. But I think it's also good to be kind of genuine to say, well, this is really how this process is going to go. So it feels more like what you'll run into as you guys go to do um, design these yourselves. So I was originally going to do just a video uh, and kind of pause and start and explain so that we don't have to wait while things load. But I just felt like, I don't know, it, it, be more real and, and no risk of you thinking that it's fake you know generally it'll take me about you know without talking if i'm just sitting at the bench this case would take me about 15 minutes to design if you know if if it's a pretty straightforward there's a lot more teeth to set you know at you know five or ten minutes on to that um i'll show you once we adapt things that it can be a little bit um slightly finicky once it comes to adapting and we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit but here's our virtual bottom you can see everything's just a little softer so what we can do now because it's blocked out our undercuts right if you look to the side here it's, it's blocked everything down to a zero so we hit free forming which is right up here 
And now it gives us the ability to manipulate this. So I'm going to go add remove. I'm going to shift. And as I go, it's going to expose and tell you kind of what the amount of extreme undercut actually exposing is. All right, same thing here. We're going to expose that undercut. And this area here, 98% of the parcels are going to be able to flex and go into that undercut on the tip of the clasp. Here, where it rolls in the major connector, this is where you have to follow the rules of partials and stay above the height of contour. So I don't want you exposing any undercut there. I want you to make sure that you're at zero degree because the path of insertion of these partials is what's going to get you to not have one fitting, not the individual undercut of the, the tooth itself in most cases. Um, on the lingual, if you feel like you didn't get enough undercut, you could expose some on the reciprocating side because it's a fully flexible partial and gain some retention from the lingual. But that's really all you want to expose. You know, if you're, you're worried about the tissue here, you can add a little bit more to give it a little bit more of a, a block out, a little buffer between it and the tissue. But that's generally the way I like, like it. Now, if you have an extreme amount of undercut, um, you know, you can, you know, leave an area, leave it up higher. So your clasp will contact here, contact maybe a half a millimeter to a millimeter of the tooth, and then be block, you know, passive all the way down to the tissue. Because usually when you look down at a tooth, you have undercut and then you have a bulbous tissue. So you can kind of have your clasp come from the top and then seal down at the bottom. So you don't have much of a risk of a food prep on those more extreme cases. So once you get everything like that, it's going to go ahead and bring in the first thing it's going to ask you is, do you want one single, you know, you have two sets of teeth, one on the left, one on the right. Do you want two unilaterals or do you want one single unit? And in this case, we want a single unit. So it sets everything up for you. I found this base thickness at a millimeter, cervical thickness at a, thickness at a millimeter and smoothing at about two is good. If you want a little bit more character showing through, you can take that, you know, down to the 0.5. But anywhere you know in there is going to be fine. That's just going to show your rugae through and stuff like that. All right. So now we mark our major connector. So you're just going to come through, and however you would want to mark it, I'm just going to kind of zip through. And I don't spend a ton of time on my initial marking. I go back and correct them. All right. And so I'm going to go through and just create my major connector clasps and everything all at the same time. Again, now back here, I'm going to do something a little unique with this tooth just for demonstration purposes. So I'm actually going to literally encompass that whole tooth, as you can see here. And then once you get to the end, double click. And that's going to complete everything and kind of create your thing. Now, I always like to create the tissue, get a look at it. And you can see here, like this is a little goofy. You could correct all that and uh, change that. But I just like to get my base down and then I can kind of manipulate things once it gives me my gingiva. And I can, I'll show you in a second, once it loads, you can take away the gingiva, you can dim it down, you can brighten it up, you can do whatever you want to as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Laptop's pretty powerful, but it's definitely not as powerful as my uh, desktop. So it takes a little longer to load some of these things as far as that's concerned. With your major connector uh, being at a millimeter uh, and with your smoothing, smoothing does add a little bit of thickness. So when it comes out, you probably be at like 1.2, 1.3. And which works out because then once you wind up smoothing things down a little bit, polishing all that, that will um, kind of add up. So I can take my ginger away, add it. Also the virtual bottom you can take away, you can bring in your model and you can make sure because virtual bottoms created a block out. You may not know where it is, but you can make sure your clasp is nicely sealed to the model by taking that virtual um, bottom away. All right, so then I'm going to apply again. You can even make changes to the thickness, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time on uh, 
on that, just so you guys get the gist of what we're doing. And you can see our undercuts. I'll show you what we're going to do here, um, just because it's a little unusual, and that way you guys will have an experience seeing it here and kind of know how to do it once we need to tap things. Because essentially what's going to happen next is the software is going to show us that tissue again. Once you agree that everything looks good, you'll move next and you'll be able to manipulate the gingiva, <clears throat> kind of make it thicker, thinner, add here and there, um, make it exactly how you want kind of fine tuning, a lot like how the teeth were, where we get them in general position. Once you get in general position, then you can go in and kind of do use the tooling to kind of do fine, finer details and, and move, make move slight differences. So everything looks good, we'll move to next. So now it kind of gives you color codes as to where you have thick and thin areas. I'm gonna go ahead and add here to get it up to the lingles of the teeth. I'm kind of getting low on time, so this may not be as pretty as uh, I'd like it. I'm sure that you guys see. So I want to get, before I mess with this tooth down here, I want to get everything exactly how I want it. So Ed, you can go over here to the anatomic, you can kind of pull and move the material. This is the larger amount of movement you can also use the small regions that will allow you to just kind of pull out just small areas like this and again although these are very similar to how we did uh, the teeth you know, have the smoothing and the additions all right once you get everything how you want it, then I'll actually attack this tooth here. And what I'll do, so I have minimum thicknesses. So if I go to take this away, it only lets me get so thin like that. But if I take desired thickness and keep bottom boundaries fixed, I can actually come in here and go right on through. So this is nice if you wanna, this is gonna wind up being I don't know what you would call a ring clasp where I'm going to totally encompass the tooth. And that's how you would accomplish that with uh, this ExoCAD software. Now, the reason I got everything else in place and everything good to go is because if I was to then go back and put the boundaries on and I hit that area, it's going to add it right back dramatically. So, um, all right. So if I dim out these teeth, you can see that the material isn't quite all the way up in the sock. It doesn't have to be totally up in there. It just want it to be close. It'll help the software to adapt because we want the gingival base to be a post up inside here. Now, if you look at the underside, right? It's poking through and that's good. If you ever have an area like that right there, right? We see that area, fill that in, put your add button. That's the air kind of things that'll give you an error when you go to adapt. So when you, before you adapt, go take a look around and make sure that you don't have anything that's showing through the model. That's one thing I've found can be a, a difficult um, problem. So I'm going to go to next. Again, this isn't as pretty as I'd like, but it's going to give you connectors here. These are kind of bigger connectors. Remember, I added in between the teeth. If you hit this plus sign and then hit adapt, it'll just make a connector between the teeth. So anywhere the teeth are touching, it creates a connector. Now that one's red and that one's red because I didn't go back and add whenever I had that little issue with the uh, the connector. So those are red. So it's telling you, yeah, those are kind of small. No big deal. We aren't really going to fabricate this one. So I'm going to go ahead and continue on. Now we're gonna do, get our settings for adapting to the sockets. One thing I will do is the pocket size, I actually take it way up to three tenths. All right, this, we're gonna be using an intermediary to bond the teeth in, you'll see on the next one. And I wanna make sure that I have some thickness of volume of material actually here. So I take consider 
um, tool diameter off because we're going to be printing the teeth. And I do like to smooth the basal of the tooth at it about 20%. That's going to smooth the bottom as it adapts. So we're going to hit apply. Now we'll see, almost kind of hope I'll get it here so I can kind of go and figure it out. But if not, I'll walk you guys through it. And so all it's going to do, one of the first things it'll do is adapt the teeth. If, if it doesn't adapt a socket on the teeth, but comes up with an error, you know it has a problem with that individual tooth. If it adapts all, all these teeth and creates a socket, but hasn't adapted this bottom to the tissue where you, you don't see that anymore, then that's gonna kind of tell you that it has a problem with the base, not the teeth itself. So as it goes along, you'll be able to hear pretty soon, you'll start to see it adapt and it'll create sockets around those, those teeth. It's like it does it in two steps. The first thing it does is it deals with the teeth, kind of creates the interface in between the bottom of the tooth and the base material. Once it's done with that, it then shifts to kind of adapting this bottom to the actual model. And so here, everything looks good. These have all adapted pretty nicely. It's created sockets. Now it's working, these are all, so it has no problems with the teeth. Now it's working on this bottom. And again, this, again, it's on my laptop. This will probably take about half the time on a more powerful desktop, not even that much more of a powerful desktop. But here, this is a good sign that this is popping up and boom, that they're just adapted, right? So you can see, if I take my jaw away, it's adapted nicely to our base model. It's adapted and created our posts here. Uh, to our teeth. And so that's really, you know, all there is to it. Um, so, all right, so I'm going to move back, minimize out of this. Great, Chris, I, I do have the results of our last poll and I'm going to launch another poll for our attendees. The next being, what are you using to design? Either Three Shape, ExoCAD or other, if you guys wouldn't mind giving us your feedback. Awesome. All right, so um, we got about um, 10 minutes. I wanna make sure I leave some time for questions. Three shape is not that different of a process, um, even using the attachment tool to process your undercuts. So um, keep that in mind. Um, you can see here, a lot of it looks very similar. Um, the results of our first poll question though, Chris, were 11% um, are using Duraflex and 89% are not currently using Duraflex. Well, great. And like I said, you can always use some of that information to uh, on other materials as well. Um, so I'm gonna review real quick uh, milling. Uh, this is, I actually have the new 53DC. It's a really awesome mill. You guys are looking to mill something to mill plastics. They have their standard or their open edge. Open edge can allow you to have more room. Um, whenever you do enter your pucks in, you'll find with removable, you will use and have more unused pucks. So I put a date on there to differentiate them. So you don't have multiple Duraflex MP 20 millimeter pucks lo logged in there. Um, be careful when you position your partial that you kind of balance out the undercuts. The, the mill can really reach some, some steep degrees of undercut. So um, it, you know, but you want to make sure you help the mill out a little bit by positioning the partial so that you see some undercut on one side, some on the other. It's not an extreme amount in one specific area. Um, when you choose, you can mill with the, the DC-53. You can mill with a three millimeter tool or the four. Um, um, you know, both are fast, but the four removes a lot of bulk pretty quickly. The big thing you want to consider um, really is how small I think if you go down to a one millimeter tool um, you'll be fine if your sockets are kind of small and limiting you may want to go down to the 0.6 um, that's totally up to you um, if you do choose the four the the four millimeter tool you're going to have to choose a six millimeter gap between your appliance which is going to eat up more puck space which may limit the ability for two partials to be placed in one puck. You can see the difference here. If you're using a three millimeter tool, you only have to have a four millimeter gap. So keep that in mind, whether the time differential, differentiation will make that much of a difference for you. Um, I like this support type. 
which was actually developed for partials. As you can see here, make sure you support your class tips. That's very important. They're flexible. So we want to keep them rock solid while things are being milled. And then once you get everything in place, um, you save Toothpath and you can mill. And this is actually the camera on the new 53. Um, it's really cool. You can see everything going on while you're actually milling your case. So it works out really nice. Um, just kind of keep an eye on things. And that mill, one of the coolest things about it is it is quiet as can be. Um, it has all kinds of insulation, um, like separate uh, panels to it. Um, and it's amazing how quiet that thing is. The teeth won't go into it too much because we're kind of getting low on time. Um, but with a SEGA, you can print the teeth. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is end it there and I'll open things up for questions. And I'm going to take this part of it and I'll add it on to our part two um, on, on next month um, when we do that. I think that'll be a good point to kind of end things. So, um, you know, thanks a lot. Um, and it is, if there's any questions, um, you will be able to, um, you know, I, I guess, the, the, Fran, had they submitted, would they, would they have submitted questions? If there was any. Yeah. So I do have some questions and I could also talk to you a little bit about how our polls look. Okay, cool. So, you know, as far as what design software, it seems like most people have a three shape with us. So 64% or three shape, ExoCAD was 18 and mm -hmm. other was 18. Yeah, and I'll find that, um, you know, three shape is definitely the most popular. It's kind of why I chose to do ExoCAD is we, we just don't see as much information on that side. And they're so similar that everyone would get a lot out of it. And, and so that's kind of why I, I went that avenue. And then as far as uh, what mills are most popular and what our attendees are using, it seems that 60% are using rolling mills, 10% are using VHF, 10% are using dense ply Serona and other 20%. Okay, yeah, I have a DC-52, I have a DC-53, and a VHF-S2. So um, all of them, those two, all those mills are really good. They all have their pros and cons. Um, the 53 is definitely, you know, I've had it for a month and a half now. Um, it's definitely geared towards milling plastics, actually working with um, some systems and um, some toolers to even push it a little bit more. It's one of those things where it's kind of new, so it's milling much faster than the 52, but we think we can even get more out of it. So we're kind of playing around with that to see, uh, you know, where, where we can take it. Great. We do have a question from Maria, and she wants to know if she can use three shape to design Duraflex removable partial. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you looked at the workflow we did with the ExaCAD and you saw those pictures, um, everything, the, the, the whole workflow is almost identical. Um, 3Shape has some pros, um, ExaCAD has some pros. Each one has their slight little advantages over the other in, in certain areas. I like both of the softwares for doing it, but 100%, um, yes, you can you know, design exactly what you saw today, but with 3Shape as well. That's excellent. If you have any other questions for Chris, please don't hesitate to type them in now at the bottom of your screen. But Chris, I want to thank you so much for preparing this for us and, you know, spending your day um, with our attendees and all of us at Zahn. Yeah, I, wanna... in, yeah, I was going to say, keep in mind that the part two is going to be taking that exact same partial that you saw that, that's milled. Um, we're going to be taking the teeth that will have been printed in Trusana and we'll be looting them together. So um, I'll actually have, you know, digital design is a little, um, it was a little um, time consuming, which will be nice because I think I'll have plenty of time to actually go into uh, how I printed the teeth. We'll touch on that a little bit and how the Trusana works. And then um, I'll have all those pictures showing them being looted together, um, what materials to use, how to create any extra retention that you want. We'll talk about polishing the, the materials will, um, you know, make sure that this will be a, uh, you know, follow through to, you know, from the start of doing the case to actually having it in a position to be able to deliver to the doctor for the patient. 
And that will be taking place live with Chris on December 15th. That's a Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern. And you can register for that, you know, at right now. Registration is open. But we do have some more questions, Chris, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, and I'll answer this one, will this webinar be available on the website? Yes, it will. Just give it like a day or so, and it will be available on YouTube. Uh, Maria has another question she wants to know is, can the mill Duraflex be relined and how? Okay, so Duraflex, one of the great things about it is things like stains, bacteria, and smells don't adhere to it. Oh, acrylics also don't chemically adhere to it. So in order to reline, you would either have to create um, mechanical retention um, for the reline to adhere, but it is a flexible material, so that can be a little precarious, um, or you can inject to Duraflex. Um, and the, the Duraflex that you mill is basically exactly the same as the Duraflex that's injected. So they will um, melt together and intertwine. Matter of fact, uh, I'll talk about repairing of Duraflex um, on this part two as well. Um, so you can kind of tune into that. But in order to inject and get it to melt, you do have to create volume. And so if it's a very thin reline, it will probably inject fine, but it'll cool off too fast to actually bond. So you would have to create volume. So what I tend to do, and, and this is kind of a whole other you know, webinar to get into, and also keep in mind, you can call uh, Indizon. They can get you in contact with Meyerson who can kind of go over this. Also on Meyerson's YouTube channel, there's a lot of webinars that gets more specific into repairing and, and or relining and what it takes to kind of get involved in that that you can go, go view on Meyerson's YouTube channel. But essentially you can re-inject to Duraflex. There's certain things that you wanna put in place to make sure you get a melt between the old and the new material. But um, that's uh, probably as far as I need to get into without spending another 20 minutes <laughs> on it. Thank you, Maria, for your questions. We have one from Christopher and he wants to know, would this be more practical than fabricating in my hand? Time-wise, of course. Yeah. So. It, it's nice on a couple avenues. One, um, I actually will totally design and mill the base out of Duraflex and I'll print the teeth out of Trusana. And if it's a try-in, I'll actually tack the teeth in the sockets with wax and send that for try-in. So at the try-in, the doctor will get a realistic um, um, fit and retention as well as check the bite and check the shade. And if the doctor comes back and says, hey, the shade is too light or whatever, I can just refabricate the teeth in a different shade and it fits right into the same base because it's the same file. If the doctor's like, oh, um, the bite is way off, right? I just tell them, I say, put it in a cup of hot water, the wax will soften, remove the teeth, put the partial in, and then do a bite on the partial. Then it'll sit down in the sockets and then send it back and then I'll refabricate the teeth. Um, if it's a small amount, maybe you can adjust it um, uh, and then re redo some anatomy, you know, how that goes. But I found to do it that way, um, it, you know, there, you have a risk of them saying, well, it just doesn't fit. But if you've totally fabricated the case, you'd be remaking at that point anyway. So yeah, that way it's really handy and fast. And when the doctor sends back and say, hey, everything was great with trying, all you do is just soften the wax, clean everything good, and then lube the teeth in and it's right back out the door once it's polished to the doctor for, for placement. Um, Design, yeah, you don't have to necessarily duplicate models. Um, sometimes you don't have to articulate. Um, you don't have to invest, boil out, inject, um, spend all the time finishing. Polishing is much easier because things are pretty much the way they need to be, especially if you design right. So time savings is at least cut in half, if not way more um, than that. Material cost, you're looking at about $10 to inject a case. You're looking at about thirty-five dollars um, to, to to mill the okay? case, so it's not a huge. It's definitely more cost of materials, but it's not a huge amount more for the amount of labor that you save. The next question is from Jerry, and he wants to know what printers are validated for Trusana. That's a great question. Um, you know, we hadn't really gotten totally into Trusana, but there's two right now: Sega and Sprint Ray. Um, there's other ones in the pipeline that are really, really close. Some of the main names that you've heard of can't really talk about it right now, but um, look for those coming, coming out soon.